Uh, the first speaker on the podium tonight, speaking in favor of the bond measures, is Scott Bailey. Scott Bailey is a native Portlander who attended Fernwood, Fernwood and Grand High School. He works in the, as an economist for the State of Washington Employment Security Department. Scott has two children, one of whom graduated from Portland Public Schools, and the other is a senior at Grant. For more than a dozen years, Scott has worked to improve quality of education for all children in Portland. He co-founded and continues to serve on the Board of Community and Parents for Public Schools. This is an organization that works at the district level on issues such as parent involvement, quality of teaching, and the equity. He is also currently active in, in to increase school funding and is treasurer of the current campaign for the local option and the construction bond. Please welcome Scott Bailey. Thanks, Mike, and thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. Thanks for Patrick being here as well. Uh, so in May, we will be voting on two measures. I think it's measure 26121 is a construction bond for schools. And measure 26122 is the local option. And I want to talk about that one first. I think all of you are aware that um, over, gosh, ever since my kids started school, we have had funding cuts, seems like every year, for education. And now it was announced today we're probably headed for another big funding cut. Now, the way school funding works in Oregon is that uh, funds across the state are spread equally so that every student gets the same per pupil funding at their school which means that we in Portland, because we have more money, pay more money in for income tax and property tax, tend to subsidize the rest of the state. The one uh, exception we have for that in the state of Oregon is what's called a local option. It's a special property tax for schools that we get to keep just within our own district. And we approved one of those back in 2006, by a good margin, thank you and it's about to run out and it has one more year. Now the state ha had placed a cap on how big that local option could be and they raised it. So what we'll be voting on is uh, for measure 26-122 is to uh, continue that local option but at a somewhat higher level so we can have more money to stay locally here to pay for teachers. The current local option pays for about 400 teaching positions. With the additional increase, it'll uh, support about 600 teachers. So 200 more than now, but we're looking at funding cuts of, I believe the current estimate is about 320 teaching positions next year. So instead of cutting 320, which would be pretty devastating, roughly more than 10% of our teaching, uh, uh, teaching uh, the number of teachers across the, the district, it would be more like a 120 positions, which is still considerable and will affect schools all across the district. So that's the levy. Uh, and a couple of things about uh, teaching in Portland. One, if you look at uh, the compensation of teachers in Portland, it's about average for the metro area. The salary cap for teaching positions in Portland is the lowest in the metro area. Teachers do pay in partly for their health care, and they do pay their share of uh, the pension fund. And sometimes you hear that teachers don't pay anything for anything in terms of their benefit. That's not true here in Portland. And my wife is a teacher. Uh, I look at her pay stub. I, know. I see what's going out. Uh, Kelly here is a teacher. She can tell you as well. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, the second uh, thing we'll be voting on, Measure 26121, is a construction bond for schools. So uh, I want to show you first a timeline for when schools were built in Portland.
and you won't be able to see the dates, but that's great. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is this is 1915, and the oldest school that's still around. I'm sorry, is back here. It's about 1907. It's Richmond School, and here's Jefferson, and a couple of other schools. The rest of the yellow dots have been replaced. So there's another wave of schools that were built in the 1930s. Or, uh, I'm sorry, this is the 1920s up into the 30s. And then a lot of schools that were built right after World War II, that's came home, started families. A lot of these schools in here were not built to last. They were thrown up, some of them with an expected lifetime of 20 years, and they're still here. So we have a lot of very old schools. The average, I think, is something like 65 years. And they need a lot of work. How many of you have been in a school recently? Okay, roughly half. So if you've been in the library at Grant High School, you will see buckets to catch rainwater from when the roof leaks when it rains. If you go into Lincoln High School, where my wife teaches, in the hallway by their library, there are buckets to catch the leaks from when it rains. This isn't an east side, west side thing. This is virtually every one of our school buildings. These buildings weren't built when we had computers and the internet. They have old wiring systems. They weren't, they weren't wired for that. They, uh, a lot of the boilers were uh, apparently from World War II ships. They're apparently the size of RVs, according to our handout. They're big and they're old. And you know, 30 or 40 years ago, hey, it's pretty cool to recycle something out of a World War II ship, but they're really old and inefficient. They need to be replaced. And, and I could go on. Every school has its story for things that aren't in good shape. Maybe it's the science lab where they don't have a tap, and so the teacher has to go down the hall to get water to bring into the class. Um, and, and if you've seen newer schools, just the contrast uh, is remarkable between what we have and what we have now. So back in 2003, the district had a committee to put together a construction bond. It was supposed to go out in 2004. But we decided not to because the repeal of the temporary income tax was on the ballot. So we decided just to fight that and not to risk losing that because that was such a big, big chunk of money. Um, so a lot of maintenance, basic maintenance, has been delayed. And thus we have buckets catching rainwater and so on. So what will this construction bond do? For every school building, it will provide that basic maintenance, keep kids warm, safe, and dry. So fixing the roof, taking care of the brick exterior, which needs maintenance, uh, safety considerations, improving those science labs, uh, helping with the wiring, some new computers. A, a lot of the district's computers are donated. They're kind of old and funky, and they, they keep things going with, with duct tape and, and rubber bands sometimes just to, to, to keep it going because that's how, how cash-strapped we are. Um, in addition to the, the base, there also be for, uh, I call it Fernwood, because that's what it was when I went there, Beverly Cleary. We'll get some major renovation around uh, earthquake strengthening. Now, we had a construction bond back in 1995, and they did uh, strengthening for earthquakes for many of our buildings, but there's still more to go. And so uh, some of the bond will go for that. And with what's happened in Japan, we know in Portland, we're not very prepared at all for the big one that we keep hearing is somewhere out in the future. The school district has a plan and has already started to prepare our school buildings so that they will be structurally sound enough so that if there's a major quake, the buildings will hold up enough for kids to be safe and to leave the building. In addition, roughly 50 of our school buildings, more than half, need major makeovers. They're old. They, they just need to be keep the nice historic exterior, get the inside rebuilt. 
Uh, when I was on that 2003 bond committee, we opened up with a slideshow from, from buildings that had been renovated in Seattle and Tacoma. And we almost started crying because we were so used to seeing crummy buildings, we couldn't just imagine having new classrooms. Um, and just the difference that makes in terms of somebody going to work there or kids being there, it's huge. Natural sunlight, what, what a concept in a school. Um, so we can't do all 50 of those buildings at once. That would be really expensive. So the district has chosen nine to start with. But this is going to be an ongoing process, probably take 25 or 30 years, a couple of different bonds that we need to get started on now. Time's wasting. Um, this is also a really good time for a construction bond for two reasons. One is interest rates are really low. They, they're not going to be lower. So that's going to lower the overall cost. We'll get more bang for our buck, pay less in interest. Secondly, there are a lot of construction workers and architects out of work right now in the Portland metro area and really across the country. This is a good time to make an investment for our kids that will also do good things for <coughs> long-term unemployed workers. So I think I'll stop there. I think I've described what we'll be voting on. Uh, I want to say just about every other district around the metro area has a continuous construction bond that voters regularly approve. So Park Rose has one on the ballot now. And in fact, if you, if you go on a per student basis, I believe theirs is bigger than ours. But it's, um, it's continuing one that's about to expire for them to do the regular maintenance, to rebuild two of their schools. So this is something that just about every other district around this house, around Beaverton and Hillsdale, uh, Hillsborough and so on, to keep their buildings in shape. So we need to start that process to get a regular bond program so that our schools are redone, modernized, and made safe for our kids. So I'll stop here and let Patrick have his turn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott Bailey. And now I would like to introduce Patrick Donaldson. Patrick will speak against the two ballot measures. Patrick Donaldson is a native Portlander who attended Richmond Elementary School and Centennial High School. Since 1976, he has owned and operated a small business. Patrick is past president of the Hollywood Boosters and past president of a coalition of 40 Portland neighborhood business districts known as the Alliance of Portland Neighborhood Business Associations, or APNBA. Patrick has four children who attended Portland Public Schools in the Grant Cluster. Since the late 1960s, he has been involved in school funding and education reform issues. Patrick Donaldson. Well, good evening. You know, today, like most days, about 45,000 young children and uh, uh, young adults filed into schools all throughout Portland, as they do every school day. And we as parents entrusted what I at least think is our most uh, precious asset in our families, our children, uh, to the care, the custody, and the well-being of the teachers, staff, and administrators of the Portland Public Schools. And similarly, each November, we entrust our finite financial resources to Multnomah County, who then distributes that to the various government entities, including the Portland Public Schools, so that they can deliver a high-quality education to those uh, children. Now, I, like Scott, I'm a product of Portland Public Schools, a public school system. Uh, we both raised our families here. We both live in this neighborhood and uh, or in this in this area of Northeast. I live in Beaumont, Wilshire. You live in, uh, what was it, not Grant Park, but? Uh, it's, it's technically Alameda. Okay. I always think of myself as Grant Park. Okay. But this place 
that we call Portland is what we all in this room call home. Now, we've come to very different conclusions about these two ballot measures, 26-121, which is a capital improvement, a construction bond, and 26-122, which is an operating levy. Um, and this evening, I'd like to address why I personally believe that these two measures, 26-121 and 26-122, present our community, all of us, with teachable moments. And I'll do so in three ways. First of all, I want to go into a little more detail about the specifics of these ballot measures that we're going to be dealing with in 50 days, um, and talk about the anticipated impacts, both positively and negatively, whether they pass or whether they fail. Secondly, I'd like to chronicle the two campaigns and talk about what the lessons are that we might derive from those campaigns. And then thirdly, I'll show you the reasons why I personally have been placed in a position to do something which I don't enjoy doing, and that is voting against two measures which I think most of us could conclude are long overdue to deal with the deferred maintenance, the crumbling infrastructure, the operations of our Portland Public Schools, but I come to a different conclusion about how we want to deal with that. Um, because ultimately, when we talk about this being about for the children, I've heard that over and over and over, ad nauseum, quite frankly, when really what it's about is about ensuring that we have achievement levels that we're proud of and our children are proud of, graduation rates that are not going down but are going up, infrastructure which is not crumbling but which is maintained, and that ultimately I believe, sort of like the intervention that we have to do with substance abusers, that we can no longer continue to enable behavior, bad behavior. I can recall as a high school student marching in this city, Scott made as well, for school funding reform. And here we are now in our late 50s talking about the same thing. For me, I'm no longer wanting to enable what I think is a system that no longer serves our children, but to serve something far different than that. Now afterwards, after we go through this, Scott and I will stand to answer questions and have a dialogue about this, uh, because I hope that we will conclude that reasonable people can reasonably disagree about some of these things. But ultimately on May 17th, we're going to know what the results of those uh, ballots are going to be. Now, 26-121, and by the way, our, this is all available online, uh, whether it be for Portlanders for Schools, or whether it be for Multnomah County Elections, or, a lot, or the Portland Public Schools website. So you can get all this. I encourage you to go to the Multnomah County Elections website to get the exact wording of this, because that's the only official and legal uh, website for this. But the question is, shall Portland Public Schools update, rebuild, increase safety at public schools, retire debt, issue $548 million in general obligation bonds, audit spending, question mark. If the bonds are approved, they will be payable from taxes on property or property ownership that are not subject to the limits of sections 11 and 11B of article 11 of the Oregon mm -hmm. Constitution. Now, I looked that up today and it's kind of interesting. We don't have time to go into that today. But the summary of that in the ballot measure and in the voters pamphlet, which will be going out here shortly, and all of that, by the way, the voters pamphlet is online, even though we don't have them in our mail yet. Portland Public School buildings average 65 years of age. Safety, security, classrooms, and technology are out of date in nearly every building. Bond funds support capital projects at 95 schools. And if you've not seen the list, that's a very interesting list. So whether you went to a school that, that that's not Rose City Park or some other school, you can find that school and find out what is being planned for that particular school, because not all are equal in that regards. 86 schools receive updates such as fire and life safety, electrical, plumbing, lighting, roofing, heating, security, earthquake safety, handicapped accessibility, modern science classrooms, classroom teaching technology, school grounds, exterior, exteriors, fields, covered playgrounds, and nine schools will be actually rebuilt. In North, Northeast Portland, that's what we're mostly uh, focused on, would be Roosevelt High School would be rebuilt. Fabian, Riggler, and Laurelhurst Elementary Schools would all be rebuilt. In South Southeast, Cleveland High School will be rebuilt, as will Marysville Elementary School. West Portland will be Markham Elementary, East Sylvan, which is on the West Sylvan campus. And then the Middle College program with Portland Community College on the Jefferson campus will be redeveloped. 
and then there will be planning, design, and preparation for re ultimately rebuilding Lincoln High School. Now, that's what we're going to all see, on, and that will be on the ballot. We get to vote yes or no based upon that. And I guess what I'd like to paraphrase is that the devil is in the details. Now, eight weeks ago, I'm a member of Toastmasters group, and I had to find a 10-minute speech to give. Now, I was not particularly, this was not on my radar screen. I'm probably like most of you. I start thinking about the ballot that's upcoming when I get the voters' pamphlet. Then I vote with my head, or sometimes I set that to the side and vote with my heart, and sometimes I set that aside and vote with my pocketbook, or sometimes I try to bring all three of those things together. But as I started writing this 10-minute speech, a speech to inform, what I started finding is that my head and my heart and my pocketbook started aching. And they started getting weary. And they started getting depressed. And they started getting sad about the fact that once again, here we are, being faced with false choices. It's always more. It's almost like the, the play Oliver. More. More. When in fact, we're not taking care of the infrastructure. Did you notice when you came in here today that this church was built in the 1920s? About the same time the neighborhood was built? about the same time that the elementary school, which is closed and is now apparently going to be, this neighborhood school is going to essentially be the parking lot for kids who are displaced as a result of the buildings of other schools around the district. I don't know how it makes you feel. If that was my neighborhood school, I would have some strong feelings about what that would be. But the devil is in the details. First of all, this is the largest public construction bond in the history of the state of Oregon. That should get everyone's attention. And it's only phase one of three phases. Are you aware that there have been three separate studies in the last 10 years of the physical plant of the Portland Public Schools? The most recent one cost us about a million dollars to tell us what we knew about 300. We, there are 300 buildings and properties within the Portland Public Schools. Subsequently, many of those, about 150, are uh, the portable buildings but the rest are physical structures or vacant lots of various sorts. In fact, it was interesting, and we'll talk about uh, Measure 122 in, in just a minute, the operating room. But I, one of the things that was mentioned about uh, by uh, Scott was the fact that the, um, uh, that the value of money is very low right now. And they actually have structured this bond in a very unique way that we haven't typically seen. So it's going to be a shorter period of time, thus saving us some interest costs. But even with that, it's going to cost us $220 million just in interest costs. Now, what's interesting about this, money may be cheap right now. If we've got savings accounts, we know about that. But what is good on one side is also bad on the other side. Because for those of us who are taxpayers or business owners, cheap money doesn't always make a lot of sense or is not always a benefit for us. It's good for those who are financing something, but those who are paying for it, that may not be in our best interest. But I want to talk about some of those things that are devils in the details. <clears throat> First of all, and this is one of the issues that has, has perplexed me and continues to perplex me. I talk about entrusting my children to the care and custody of the Portland Public Schools. And please, nothing that I say tonight is meant to cast any aspersions on any single person who was employed by the Portland Public Schools. My daughter-in-law is a teacher. My youngest daughter, graduate of Grant High School, no Scott's son, is, uh, is on her way to becoming a teacher. It's an honorable profession. People who choose to work in the school district, regardless of what position it is, uh, are honorable people. They are my neighbors, they are my family, they are my friends, they are us. But sometimes things happen inside of organizations where the personality changes. And this is an example of that. This issue of transparency. Why is it that the report from the most recent report, the million dollar report about the condition of the physical plant, why is that not available to us to look at, to test that report along with the assumptions of the bond measure? That doesn't engender for me trust and belief in transparency. That gives me questions about government going on in the shadows. Now what's interesting, and I mentioned this specifically, is the Portland Public Schools, in order to make the pitch, claims that the average cost of a house in this city is about $140,000-$50,000 in terms of the assessed value. Now, the Oregonian claims it's $180,000. Multnomah County tax assessments say it's about $170,000. But whichever way you look at it, that number then is the basis by which we start doing the calculations. 
So if you accept the Portland Public Schools lower assessed valuation, the cost of this to each of us in this room, on average, if our house is worth $150,000 assessed value, and that's easy to find out. I can find out, you can find out about my assessed value on my house on Northeast 41st, and I can find out your assessed value wherever you live. It's a matter of public record. Just go up to Multnomah County uh, website, the assessors, uh, click on the, uh, the taxation department and click on the assessors button, put in your address, and there you go. You can find it and calculate it out. So go home tonight and forget what the voters pamphlet says. Do your own calculations. In fact, I think there's a thing at the back of the room to allow you to do this. But let's assume for a minute that the average cost is $170,000 per year. That's going to be about a $300 per year increase for six years. Remember, this is phase one. Phase two and three is to come. They're talking about $1.4 billion in cost for we, the taxpayers, over this period of 15 to 20 years. That, that should say something. And I looked at the demographics of Rose City. It's very interesting about the few number of households that have more than two people in them and have children in them. The demographics are trending in a different fashion here. And what that means is that more and more pressure is being placed on fewer and fewer people who are making less and less money because they are less and less employed. We are aging in these communities. And I, the implications of it are strong. And I, you know, I think that I'd like to hear from Scott a little bit later as an economist who plays with these numbers all day long about what that means. What are the implications of this? In fact, one of the estimates is by the Urban Economist Association is that approximately a thousand people in the city of Portland, homeowners in the city of Portland, will in fact, their homes will go into foreclosure as a result of economic displacement as a result of this ballot measure. Similar to what previous displacements have taken place as a result of ballot measures. There's also on the other hand of those things, there's economic offsets, as, as Scott has mentioned with regards to employment, high wage jobs, all those things. And I'm glad, to, I'm not glad to hear that, that uh, engineers and architects are gainfully unemployed right now and that, that we're going to be able to put them back to work. The question is, are we getting them for a lower amount, a higher amount? What does that ultimately mean? Are we getting a bar bargain as a result of that? And think about all of these things. Each one of these bond measures, and once again, go to Multnomah County elections, and you can go back in time way, way, way back into the 50s. And what's interesting about most all of these, and particularly the construction associated with them, when was the last time you heard of a project that was on time, on budget, and on target? That's how we do business in the city that works. We don't do it on time. We don't do it on budget. We may get it on target, ultimately. A $750,000 consulting contract creeps up to a million dollars just to do assessment of the physical plant in the city. And think about what just passed recently with the Fire Bureau, with the new uh, levy for that with the Oregon Historical Society, creep, 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 creep. If these measures pass, we will be the highest tax community in the state of Oregon and the top 20% of the United States of America. Now that's not necessarily inherently bad because what's the value received as a result of that investment? But I have to ask yourself, is this the right time at the right place in the right way that will prevent, that will take care of our needs but also make sure this doesn't take place in the future? And with all due respect to the, the map, this is great. I find out that my school, Richmond School, that I first started off in here, was one of the oldest schools. Now, I was over there just recently to see one of the oldest schools, as a matter of fact, last week, just like I went last week to the newest school, Rosa Parks. You know what I found out? That that old school called Richmond, for whatever reasons, is very well maintained. There's an esprit de corps there that is very interesting. Going to Rosa Parks, the newest school, the latest green, sustainable, etc you would not know that it's the most recent school the city has. The absence of, of maintenance and operational efficiencies are staggering. Why is that happening? That's not about money. That's about a commitment or a lack of commitment to protect the investment. And if we built a bunch of schools back in the 20s that were only designed to let last 20 years, then where is the Portland Public School Board and the Central Office Administration to plan for that eventuality? If these schools were built in the 20s, and they were meant to last 20 years into the 40s, then what's happened between the 40s and now the 21st century with regards to creating a sinking fund to replace those schools? <clears throat> what's happened with that? Look at this, this church here. Look how old it is and how it's maintained. It's still standing. It's still in the same earthquake faults that Lincoln High School and Grant High School and Rose City is. 
And the question is, where's our commitment to those kinds of things? Now, I could go on and on and on about these things. In fact, the, what I found is in these last few weeks, just making these photocopies, the more I got into this as a taxpayer, as a, commi as a committed person to public schools, I got more and more discouraged and more and more upset that more questions were being asked than were being answered, that less transparency was being seen, less confidence in the road ahead was, was there. So will my grandchildren be faced with the same challenge that my children were faced with? And if so, why? This is not about dollars, this is not about replacing, not about doing business in a prudent way. This is about people being either unwilling or unable to make the hard decisions. And we heard an example of that earlier when Scott talked about a decision not to go forward with a construction bond because of a political decision. Sort of like the political decision that's being made to put this on the May ballot, where fewer people turn out. In fact, if you have not been called recently about by the campaign, we'll talk about the campaign in a minute, it's probably because you're not what's called a four by four voter, you're not friendly to the issue, and we don't want you to be turning off to vote. We want to target you specifically if you're going to vote in favor of us. That's what's going on here. So if you haven't gotten the call, you've been identified somewhere as a person who is not necessarily favorable to that. I'm anxiously awaiting to have my second call because I am on the list of being favorable to this. Now, 26-122. Now, with all due respect, Scott, when you make a comment that says that it's a, a small increase in the operating levy, right now we're paying $1.25 per thousand evaluation. It's proposed to go up to $1.99 per thousand of, pop, of assessed value. Now that's 74 cents per thousand of valuation. That's a 60% increase in that rate. That's 74 cents increase over $1.25. To me, that's not small. That's not small. And we all like to have teachers in the classrooms. We want to have our children, our grandchildren in classrooms that are small, with a greater connection with the teachers accordingly. Similar to Scott's wife, who is a teacher at Lincoln High School, and teaches small groups of kids because she teaches a very specialized program of art and, and uh, photography. But I think the question that we have to ask yourself, if you live in this community very long, have you seen the, the front page of was it Life magazine or Look magazine, the double spread, showing the largest high school in the United States of America from a picture about like that? Grand High School, almost 4,000 students. Closed campus, 40 and 50 kids in a classroom. Now I suspect many of those people who graduated from there would say that they got one heck of an education. It wasn't about the age of the building, the size of the classroom, it was about the quality of teaching and the expectation of what was going to happen there, a commitment to excellence. So with regards to this operating levy, I'm very concerned about it. And I guess what I would say is that I feel very resentful that I have found myself in a position as an advocate for public schools and how critical they are to stable neighborhoods and business districts to find out that as I pull the curtain back and look deeply into this, that I'm more dis, uh, dissuaded to vote for this than to vote for it. And I would encourage you to have that same journey. And ultimately on May 17th, when you get your ballot, by the way, it'll be going out here probably in the next week, uh, to please be sure and look deeply at these issues. And vote with your head, vote with your heart, and vote with your pocketbook. And when those three things happen, when you know, K-N-O-W, the facts, you are going to be more inclined to vote N-O on both these matters. Thank you. Okay, I'm sure that these presentations have given you lots of uh, thoughts and little things that are floating around in your mind now that you want to resolve. So we'll, we'll start with the questions. And then there could be a comment. You could say, I saw this. What do you say about it? And both of our speakers will be able to do it today to answer. But uh, uh, you know, we, we don't want to leave this thing hanging at the end. So right around 8.30, about 45 minutes from now, We'll stop and allow the speakers then to summarize your questions, their remarks, and, and kind of wrap the thing up. Then when we're done, uh, there are uh, materials in the back tables. We'll still be able to talk to them and talk to one another and, and uh, see where you go from, from there as we approach the election day. So if you, if you don't think you can ask a question that everyone can hear, you're free to come up and use the microphone. Can everybody hear me without it? It gives you an idea of how you have to project, because there's a lot of room 
behind us to absorb sound, so uh, you have to really speak up. But the, uh, you can ask the question individually uh, to, to one of the speakers, or you can put it out and they'll figure out who's going to go first uh, and, and take care of business there. So, do I see a hand right here? I have a question. Um, in the literature, part of the bond issue is to rebuild Marysville School. If the bond measure doesn't pass, what are those children? Are they going to stay at Rose City Park? Or has that decision been made? Do you want to just take the microphone from the table? Sure. Uh, better stay at the podium, the mic buzzes when people touch it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a quick answer. The question was, what's going to happen with Marysville? Because part of the bond talks about um, repairing Marysville. And the short answer is, I, I personally don't know. And I don't know if the district has made a decision on that. Um, they're supposed to break ground on the renovation of Marysville early in May, according to Kelly. Um, but I don't know. Good, oh, good question. I didn't know if someone in the audience knows has yeah. heard. I don't think the answer has been uh, provided by the Portland Public Schools. They would know that. But the question I would ask in conjunction with that is, when that school burned, the belief was that there was insurance on it. And by the way, there was. And that insurance, instead of being set over here to then apply towards the rebuilding of that school, instead was pulled off and spent elsewhere for more pressing needs. So now here we have a school that is no longer habitable. The children are now here in a school. Wasn't this school, weren't we told that this school was uninhabitable, Rose City Park Elementary? It was uninhabitable, it was dangerous. It was, it was, we simply couldn't have it. And so now we're able to put those Marysville kids in there. And when they move back to their school or wherever they ultimately go, then the Laurelhurst kids will come over here. Now where are all the Rose City Park Elementary kids? Scattered to the winds. Is that a neighborhood school? One of the oldest neighborhoods in this city, scattered to the winds. That's the way we, that we do business here. Uh, another question up here. Yeah. Yeah. I had two questions for uh, Scott. Um, the first one is on 26, 1, and 21. And uh, I was wondering if you knew what the cost per square foot on the rebuild of Roosevelt High School would be. If maybe Cleveland as well. <coughs> and on 26 122, I had a question as what is the total cost per teacher retained per year? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not a construction guy, so I don't know the cost per square foot on those. I do know that, um, you know, we have a choice with schools about whether we raise them and build from scratch, or whether we keep the historic exterior and gut. And it's usually a bit more expensive to do the latter. And yet people in those neighborhoods usually really want to hold on to that, that school's personality and do it like that. And sometimes those buildings have been declared historic sites and you can't just tear them down. So there's complications around that, but I don't know the square footage around that. Uh, the cost per teacher, the average cost per teacher in Portland, uh, including benefits, I believe, is in the neighborhood of $80,000. Yeah, you see, I would, when you um, calculate, you've got 19 to $21 million of extra revenue, and you say you're retaining 200 teachers. It works out to somewhere between 95000 a year to 106000 which is kind of at the high end of even your salary scales and compensation. So I'm just wondering why, and those aren't the types of salaries and teachers that are not are going to be let go. It's going to be more the lower uh, seniority teacher, and their costs are a lot, quite a bit lower than that kind of level. I can answer that question, I think, to a degree, um, if you don't mind. Uh, I did a look at, at the, the problem is the, the, the low-priced ones are paid abysmal wages, and they're the ones laid off. They, they're way down the scale. But if you look at the lopsidedness of the teacher thing, the top 
30% of the teachers are all in one pay bracket. It's $72,000 and about 65% for fringe benefits. So they're at $109,000. So you're keeping those people and laying off the $38,000 teacher. That's what's happening to it. As long as I'm up, can I make a kind of a short well, statement? Let's, let's wait for, uh, I have no comment. Okay, he has no comment. You can, can, take, can I take the opportunity to make a short statement? Um, let, let's, let's wait just a minute. Okay. Okay, because we want to get through the rest of the questions first. And then I'm sure we'll have time for that. Uh, another question back here, Terry? Hi. Terry Parker, Rose City Park. I went to Rose City Park School the last time I was in the school was when they closed it, and I thought it was still a gorgeous school at that time. They've done a lot of renovating. I, went, I graduated Madison uh, when Madison had 2,400 students. Not a, not a small school. Class sizes were as many as 40. Uh, Portland, one of you mentioned the uh, fire bond that's going to raise taxes approximately $200. Uh, they're talking about water rates going up 86% uh, uh, or someplace in that, in that category. And this school bond, the two school bonds could raise taxes as much as four to five hundred dollars on the average homeowner. What do you say to the people that are being taxed out of their homes? This may be the straw that just does that with, with these other things that are coming along. And most of these people are probably going to be senior citizens on fixed incomes. So what do you do? Send them off to a race and ranch? What kind of services are they going to require if they're taxed out of their homes? Well, maybe Pat, you should go first since you brought that issue up. Well, you're exactly right. And I think that, first of all, what the district needs to do is what all of us would do in our own situation. We look internally about those things that we can jettison that cost us money that don't bring us value. If you've got a, a, a system that was designed, look at this map. Let's use the auto visual that we were given here. Look at the map. Look at the peaks there. That represents the highest population we've had in the school system, about 86,000 students. How many are we at right now? At about 45,000. There's some disagreement about those numbers, but it's about that number. And look at the chart where it's going in terms of its growth pattern. Talk to the Portland State University Center for Population Research to find out what the plan is. This is not a city that's growing with numbers of kids. So we've got a system designed for 80,000 kids with infrastructure for that. And so it's costing us an arm and a leg for that. So let's right-size the organization, number one. Number two, let's stop having the false choices between these issues about keeping all these buildings going for different purposes. At Kellogg Elementary School today on Powell, the place was packed. It was packed with City of, employee, City of Portland employees doing some sort of a training program, because that school has been closed for quite some time. Been down to Washington High School recently, and the district is getting ready to sell that for maybe under two, uh, under $2 million. So what happens is these facilities are allowed to atrophy. Are you aware of the old Adam, Adams High School site on 42nd and Killingsworth that became Whitaker School that had asbestos and other kinds of problems? Are you also aware that the Archdiocese made a full cash $10 million offer that the Portland Public Schools passed on because they wanted to have that land because someday we might need it again? That's the first place we begin, is right-sizing the organization. And back to the issue about pricing us out. This uh, Urban Economist Association, it's very interesting, the report, that talks about this displacement that's going to take place. People will make actions with their, they will move. They will make other adjustments. I'm on the board of the Loaves and Fishes, and let me tell you, we're dealing with this every single day. And the question is, if you're going to suddenly have 40 to 70 to $80 a month less in your pocket, what's going to go? What's going to go? I, you know, that's, that's the question. And not, and uh, once again, any of us can go in these buildings, and we know that they are in need of serious help. Instead of saying that the solution is to repair, to replace, the question we have to ask is, if we're going to replace, then there's got to be a quid pro quo to make sure this never happens again. Because down here, we knew that there's a useful life of 75 to 100 years for these buildings. Why weren't we using sinking funds and other kind of preventive maintenance? There's a quotation I found from a janitor over at Da Vinci Arts that talked about what's going on there, the cut, 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 cut for 
cleaning these things and maintaining them, allowing roofs to have water and then spilling and wrecking walls. I mean, it's insanity. Not that the people are insane, but there's something that's going on there that is uh, causing this. Scott, I'm sure you have a few words to say. Yeah, I do have a few words to say. Are you going to complain about having your neighborhood school closed and then say, let's right-size the organization? Nobody wants their neighborhood school closed, and yet, is that, is that our solution or not? Let's take a look at history of school funding in Portland. Before 1990, we were pretty well funded and had a big maintenance department. And capital improvements came out of the regular budget because we could afford it. So back in the late 70s when we created middle schools and did some major renovations at schools to turn them into middle schools, that just came out of the regular budget. There was no construction fund. We didn't need one. And I think, frankly, when after 1990, when we went to school equalization, when Measure 5 kicked in, we probably, the leadership of the district probably didn't respond well. But here's how they responded, and I think it's, it's pretty understandable. They started to have to make cuts. And what, was, what did they hear from the public? Don't lay off our teachers. And frankly, I think if any of you were parents during that era and you went to a school board meeting, that's what you were saying. So what did they cut instead? They cut the central office. They cut maintenance. And here's where we are. They have tough choices to make every year about what to cut. Do we save class sizes up? Do we cut maintenance? It wasn't easy. But they made those choices. And we can look back and criticize them for that and say, why wasn't there a sinking fund? Why didn't we fire a couple more teachers to save some money to put into maintenance of buildings? Is that what you would have done? So you can second guess that decision, but there's, there's where we are. And if you think, you, you know, talk about uh, class sizes and where they are today and where they were 30, 40 years ago. If you think kids today are the same as kids 30, 40 years ago, that you haven't been in schools. You don't know that, uh, you know, kids, uh, special needs kids, we used to warehouse them but the law changed, and now many of them are in regular classrooms. It's different. We have many kids whose parents don't speak English. That's a, like it or not, that's the reality of what's in our schools. So there's at least 80 different languages spoken by kids at home in Portland Public Schools. That's true, really, all, just about all over the country. That's just what's happening with immigration. Um, so things are different today. And so you can look back and say, why didn't we have a sinking fund? Why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that? Well, hello. Here's a school board finally taking the bull by the horns and saying, we have to do something about maintenance, about keeping up our buildings. It's going to cost money. There's no way around it. And here's the plan. It's going to take about 20 years. They paid for the studies. They've done their homework. They know what's needed. So you can criticize and complain about past decisions, about you know the, the K-8 thing. I didn't like the K-8 decision either, okay? But it's done, it's passed. We have to go ahead and say, are we gonna take care of our buildings or not? That's the question. Is it gonna cost money? Yes. Is that gonna be hard on some households? Absolutely. As economists, that's part of my job is documenting what's happening to people in this economic downturn. And it's ugly. And most of the impact has been felt by lower income households. And I know that, and I see that where I work. I make presentations on it all the time. It tears my heart up, I tell you that. But our choices now with this, with these bonds is, you know, what do we do? Do we let our schools fall apart in terms of buildings? Do we let class sizes soar? Do we fire some more teachers? It's a tough decision. There's no way around it. But I think the responsible thing to do right now is to start to take care of those buildings, to do that maintenance, and move ahead. 
and to keep, to minimize the number of teachers we're going to get rid of next year to take care of our kids and to move forward. And if we don't do that, we know there's going to be, uh, we know that as class sizes go up, who's hit the hardest with that? Is it the middle class kids like my kids and what Patrick's kids are? Our kids will find a way. It's the lower income kids that need more attention in, in classes that are going to hit the hardest. And it's just the way it is now. And just frankly, what I see in this country right now is a lot of fighting over issues like this that were caused by some irresponsible people on Wall Street, largely. And we get stuck fighting over it. And that's part of what's going on here. And I, to me, that's the big picture. And uh, it makes me pretty sad sometimes. But what we're left with now is some very tough decisions at the local level. And I think the way forward is to vote yes on these measures to take care of our kids. Question over here on the side. Hi there. Um, so I have a question and some comments, basically. Maybe more comments. But um, just wanted to let you know that, so I'm one of those four, we call them four square voters, where I'm, I'm probably the dem demographic of you as a school employee who wants to see the measure go through. I'm probably the person you want to be talking to and you expect to vote for you. I have two children. We've lived here in Rosalie Park for 10 years. We moved here when we had a local middle school, a local elementary school, and a local high school. We um, waited a while to have kids, and unfortunately for us, when we finally didn't have kids in the school area, age bracket, we lost our elementary school, our middle school, and the high school. We now turn around and drive the opposite direction from downtown where we work, drop our kids off in schools, in neighborhoods that we don't really participate in, we don't shop in, we don't visit, we don't have anything to do with them. We try our best to still be involved with the, our children's school and the community, but it's very hard. I work for a nonprofit that brings renewable energy to school kids and many schools throughout the U.S., and I work with Portland Public Schools. I really want to vote yes. I really want to improve the infrastructure of the buildings my kids are in. However, we're sort of fighting some demographic issues that I fully understand, having studied urban planning. Um, a lot of the people with kids and money moved out of our inner cities during the 70s and 80s and sequestered themselves in smaller communities where they could vote to support their own little local schools, and those have grown, and they have the money and resources to keep keep those schools up. Even more people then move out of the central city to go to those better schools. Again, we're chasing fewer dollars, and our schools are have fewer people. That's fine. I understand that. But on the other hand, everyone here who's a little older than me has mentioned that when they were in these schools, there were 40 kids in a classroom, and we all know that classroom size is an issue. So, okay, our local elementary school has always wavered between three and 700 kids. It got down to about three or four in the last 10 years, and they closed it. They closed it after the parents and the people in the neighborhood spent $70,000 to improve the grant. They closed it telling us that it was uninhabitable for children and it was just simply subpar. And then I put up, as everyone's mentioned, everyone from Marysville back into schools. So I know, as a, a voter and a resident and a person with two children, that there's a lot of people in the community who don't trust the schools to be able to pull off and <coughs> keeping schools going to keep the rate down coal is terrible. No one likes what happened. Um, we had a chance to get another school board, uh, or a school superintendent. The board didn't even do an executive search. They just bumped the next in line up. And she's continued policies that most people in my neighborhood agree are completely wrong, and were a failure, and have screwed up what education we could have been providing. Um, if you can come up with a plan to give us back at least one local school, if you can tell us that so frustrated. Sorry, I'm very upset about the issue, but you know, if, if there can be a better relationship between the community and the school board, I've been to many a uh, neighborhood meeting where we've had people from the school board come and tell us this or that about our local school, and every sing single thing they've said has sort of been not true or not really upheld or didn't matter in the end. We don't trust and appreciate what's been going on for the last five, ten years, and I'm not going to vote for the levy. It'll probably fail because I know a lot of people aren't. Hopefully next year they'll try it again. But next year, there better be a plan to give us a decent superintendent, someone who really cares about public education, restructure the schools to give us back one or two local schools that are actually still an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school. The K-3 thing sucked. My, I had to take my kindergartner into the school his first day, and there were kids that were taller than me. Not a problem. So, um, yeah, so I, I think I'm we just, got the I'm, just So if they, if they can come back to something better, and if they can fix the relationship with the communities, 
happy to vote myself out of bread and butter to, to help build, rebuild the school, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah, Scott, do you want to take a, a shot at those comments? <laughs> yeah. well, one, I don't blame you for being mad about your school being closed. I would have been too, and maybe would still be, and, and, I, and I understand that. But I, want, I do want to talk a little bit about the K-8 thing, because uh, I went to K-8. Guess what? There were big kids there, and I was a kindergartner, and probably most of us when we ran. And I don't know if you're talking about Roseway Heights. My son goes to Gregory Heights, renamed Roseway Heights. Yeah. Still says Gregory Heights in the stones up the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that the principal worked really hard there. She's wonderful. With yeah. the middle grade kids to say, guess what, guys? You're your, uh, your big brother and big sister to a lot of little kids here, and you need to be responsible. You need to be role models, you need to reach out, and <laughs> work to connect kids, and did a great job on that. Um, so, uh, about, about the other things, if you're unhappy, the, the, the question I have is, you know, again, I've been unhappy with some decisions that have been made. That's why I spend a lot. Of, I'm not a public school employee. Okay, um, I ran for school board two years ago. I didn't win, but I ran because of a lot of issues and things I wasn't happy with, and some things that I was happy with that I wanted to see maintained. And I'll just go that far and say that. Um, but will voting no? get you what you want. And I don't know that it will. What voting no on the levy will get us is a couple hundred fewer teachers next year. And that's just not a good thing. And I have spent hours and hours and hours for over a dozen years now working on the issues, working with the administration on things like that. And that's to me is the way to push for changes. Voting no is not going to be, it's it's just not connected. I understand your frustration, but it's just not connected. That's, that's what I can say. Um, I want to uh, respond to one other thing that you kind of touched on and, and Patrick said also, clear up a misconception. Enrollment in Portland Public Schools bottomed out and is now headed up. A lot of that bottom now was pure demographics, but it's been increasing the last couple of years and faster than what uh, the dem demographers at Portland State anticipated. And I think we've had a lot of young 20-something creatives move into this city in the last couple of years, and guess what? They're settling down and having kids. So I don't think we'll ever get back to what we had 80,000 kids at one point, but we bottomed out and are heading upwards modestly in population. Um, I'll stop there. Patrick, do you want to respond? I have to applaud Scott for being the man in the arena. If you looked at his campaign and remember him going around the hustings, he was accessible. He raised a lot of money from very grassroots. The person who ultimately beat him Look at her campaign, her contributions and expenditures and see the nature of her campaign. And why is not Pam here tonight? Why isn't she facing the people who elected her? Now keep in mind, school board people serve an incredible uh, tenure as a school board person for this amount of compensation. And they're criticized at every turn. So I don't blame them at some level about that. But I think we ought to thank Scott for stepping into the gap there accordingly. But here, I want, to, I want to characterize something. I'm looking forward to the morning of May 18th when both measures 26-121 and 26-122 have failed at the polls. That will be an unbelievable wake-up call to the school board, to the central administration staff, the $700,000 of donations, 30% of which have come from out of this state, mostly from construction and architectural firms. It'll be a wake-up call. And what will fill that void, we're not going to allow our public school system to fall by the wayside. What's going to happen is people are going to say, okay, now let's get serious about this. Let's ask 
the hard questions and give the hard answers and get this taken care of. And Scott, I have never suggested that we close neighborhood schools to right size the district. Neighborhood schools should be maintained. Those schools that simply are no longer neighborhood schools or can't be with can't be maintained because of their bad physical condition need to be replaced. In fact, the argument that we had with Vicki uh, Phillips all the time was this false choice. These schools were going by the wayside. The best way to deal with that is build a new school and then people get to participate in that. Nobody's losing something, they're gaining something. And uh, I'm not talking about firing teachers. I'm talking about the same things you and I do in our lives, our personal lives and our business lives, is to, to adjust accordingly. And the demographics, despite the fact that you say they're going up, they're not going up to an 86,000 person school district. Let's get rid of some of this property. Let's use those dollars. Let's not spend the insurance money when something burns. And by the way, the thing about earthquake, 7% of those dollars, don't have any illusions that this is going to fix the schools from earthquakes like Japan. 7%, 7%. Look at the website of Fort Public Schools about that and find how little of that money is being used. Can I ask a question, Michael? Uh, I just wanted to say that there's a lot of speculation about the demographics and the new census figures, which will provide a lot of clarity to this, will be coming out, I think, in early July. That will have some specifics of, with regard to some of the neighborhood demographics that will support or not support what some people are saying. Okay, another question. That's fine, Michael, you know, the demographics are being worked on, but the important thing is, is what do you do with the, demo demo with the demographics when you get? Now, you said that the, uh, the school district has done its homework, and this time it's going to do the right thing. I remember back in the 70s when the, uh, the Portland Public Schools did a large demographic study, and it just happened that here in this neighborhood, there was one of those administrators that worked on it. He was a member of St. Rose Parish. We got a school down here on 54th and Alameda. And he contacted us uh, at the parish, contacted our pastor, and uh, three or four of us got together and we studied this demographic information. And then over the next five or six years, we cut the size of our school in half. And we're very effective, and uh, you know, that was the time when people weren't having eight children like I had. You know, that was the time when the, the Catholic demographics were just really dropping. And we were managed, we managed just a, you know, a bunch of, guys in a small school here in the neighborhood, we managed to take that information and use it properly and uh, save our school, is what it did. And I would expect the Portland Public Schools to do the same thing. You mentioned something about construction costs. How much is it per square foot? Yeah. I got a memory of that. I came to Portland in 1956. I just graduated from Gonzaga University. My boss there, the man, the priest, who was the treasurer, came here at the same time. His job was to build Jesuit High School. Now, I have worked with him at Gonzaga. We built three good-sized buildings up there. So he and I have kind of worked together as a, as, as a team on this. So I volunteered to help on it. And so we worked with the contractors and that sort of thing, just like we had before. And uh, it was really interesting to me because at the same time, the Portland Public Schools were building Madison and they were building Wilson. And we built Jesuit High for $12 a square foot in those days. Those two schools cost a little over $24 a square foot. And I can guarantee you that the education going on in Jesuit was every bit as good or probably better than in those other schools. But we were very, very careful with the money that we had. And I think that's one thing that, uh, in my experience, I don't think that the Portland Public Schools I've been very careful with our money, and I think maybe we need to tell them to start doing that. Now, if St. Rose down the street here can respond to a demographic study that the Portland Public Schools can, and we can downsize our school, and, and the Portland Public Schools, they don't seem to be able to deal with that. They probably just put the, the report on the shelf, and they're dealing with cutting from, what was it, 86,000 to 45,000 students? just isn't very good management. I guess that's not a question, it's just a comment, but I, I kind of think that's where we are. <laughs> well, uh, gentlemen, do you uh, wish to respond, or is that pretty much, uh, I think your remarks
you already covered that? Scott? It's hard to defend decisions made in the 1980s. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I can only speak to what the needs are now and where we go from here. And, you know, Pam and the rest of us, I have to say, Pam and the rest of the school board members are out doing these presentations. Couldn't be here tonight. I'm not a fill-in. I'm a volunteer who does this. Uh, they, they've all been out actively looking. And I think the brave volunteer, too. <laughs> uh, because uh, a lot, as we've heard in the discussion, a lot of these uh, issues hinge on uh, very squishy facts and information uh, since we're not doing an in-depth study here tonight. Uh, that's why I think uh, it's been said that it's up to us to continue uh, this discussion among ourselves and in our own minds as we approach election day. Uh, Richard, do you have a... Yeah, can I make that comment now, please? Uh, who's, who's said that? I did. Oh, oh okay. I, <laughs> the light was right in my face. And I, didn't, I didn't see your lips move. Oh, I see. I'm a researcher with the Tax Foundation of Oregon, That's what I, and it's a volunteer job, but I've been doing this for a lot of years. So I went to the state website, and the question is, you, several people raised it, is there money in the budget to take care of maintenance? The, the statements were made, there isn't. So I looked at all the area schools, I think they're worth looking at. With one exception, you look at Beaverton, Centennial, Hillsboro, Lake Oswego, North Clackamas, which is uh, Oregon City, and Tiger Tualatin School Districts. They're all in the same area we are, right? They're all they're doing a student between eight and $9,000 per student per year. Now you go to Portland, $11,243 per year per student. Now that's a lot more money. That's several thousand dollars more. If they took a mere $1,000, got it down to $10,000, and change, they'd still be the highest district in the whole area, and they'd have $45 million to spend on maintenance. So I don't think, they haven't managed $400 million budget very well over the years. I don't think they can manage a 500, a half a billion dollar construction budget any better, like the last guy said here. The second thing is, I object to this, you know, the average house is, are assessed at 150, 170, pick a number. That's true, but anybody who bought a house in the last 10 years, that's not true. Those house assessed values are low because of measure five, and they've been held down at 3% a year. If you bought a 200, an average house in this town is about $275,000 now, it would be assessed at that. So I arbitrarily went and said, Let's take a $235,000 assessed house. Maybe it was bought a few years ago. They're paying a $5,000 and change tax bill right now. If these both pass, that tax bill goes to $5,900, and the following year is $6,100. Now that's a, that's a huge increase for lots of people. And then lastly, let me say this. Do you know that your school district's already borrowing $465 million? Did you know that? They didn't fund the, I mean, they chose not to fund the, uh, the retirement, the PERS the right way, so they borrowed some money for it. It's $465 million. If this passes, they'll have a billion dollars plus borrowed. Now that's real money. For that, I should, in fact, I did the arithmetic here. It's $22,000 in change per student. That's what the borrowing will be at that point. Of debt? Per of debt, debt per student. It'll be a billion and thirteen, hundred and thirty thousand dollars A billion and, I got one oh one three. We don't get that tax money back, so we're not borrowing. Pardon me? <laughs> we don't get that tax money back. No, no. But, but the point is, I, I think it's in their budgets. They should have done it. I have no more faith based on the way they're running their budget that they're going to do it any better with this kind of money than we've seen so far. And, it, and, and I hate to use this analogy because it's not quite, it's a little bit strong and it's a little bit over the top, but you don't give an addict more, <laughs> more drugs. 
At some point, we've got to say no, and somebody's going to have to wake up and say, let's run this as well as the, the surrounding school districts or something close. Okay, thank, thanks, Richard. Uh, Scott, do you want to say something about the debt issues? And, you know? Yeah. First of all, Richard, I believe you're incorrect that when a house is sold, it, the assessed value does not go up to the market value. It goes up at most 3% a year. No, it goes up It goes up to a to a figure it based goes, on the recent sales. It goes up by the recent sales? Not yeah. what I bought. No, may, may I just jump in because I know about the issue. It, so when, when you buy a house, there's a new real market value, but the tax assessor applies the same ratio of assessed value to real market value as the typical house. So then in fact, let's say if the ratio of assessed value to real market value for most homes are 60%, then they'll take the, the value of the, the market value of the house you just bought it for and they apply 60% of it and make that the new AV to maintain parity so that it's not, so, so your statement was just incorrect. I mean, you could argue whether the, the um, average um, assessed value of properties in, in this I believe she's right. is 144000 or not, but it does not jump up. I, I, I believe you're right on that, but, but it, the easy way is go take your tax bill. You just paid it in November, right? You've got it somewhere. Add 16% to it if both of these pay, pass, whatever it is. Now, if it's five thousand dollars, sixteen percent is eight hundred dollars more. If it's uh, take your take your number, you'll know the number. But it, it's a flat sixteen percent, roughly, because they're going to raise it three percent as the usual matter anyway. So it's thirteen percent for these bills, three percent for the raise, and you're going to get sixteen percent. Okay. So a second thing about uh, Richard said about uh, they didn't do the retirement thing right. This had nothing to do with Portland Public Schools. It was happened to every uh, every school district in the state, and maybe the whole state, back to a judge's decision back in how FERS was this complicated, and I used to be able to rattle it off what it was. It was back in 1999. What the district did then was something in uh, 2002, 2003, and it was Jim Scherzinger who who put this through, and I think you'll agree, Jim is a pretty smart guy about finance stuff. Um, they did borrow money called PERS bonds. They invested that money and did very well with it, anticipating that they would have to pay off this PERS liability. And it turned out to be a pretty smart move. So that's one of those things where borrowing actually made sense, and they were able to uh, make some extra money off of it in order to pay down their first liability. And I'm sorry, uh, I'm not a finance guy, um, but I, I sat down with people and said, explain this to me a couple of years ago. Um, and, and I, um, so it's, it, it wasn't an irresponsible thing, it wasn't. A it, it had some logic to it, it didn't pay off particularly well because the stock market tanked afterwards, right? And, and so it was, it was a kind of a medium well. thing, but it does not change the fundamental thing. You're borrowing lots of money per student, and there's no reason for a school district with 45,000 students to have a billion dollars in debt in a state that supposedly doesn't allow debt. That doesn't make sense. I mean, this state has to have a current budget every year at a state level. They can't borrow. But the school district's going to borrow a billion dollars. But they issue bonds all the time for construction. That's outside of that. They do borrow for construction projects. It's how we, governments all do this. Come on. Yeah. Um, Patrick, do you? I, would, I, would, <coughs> I don't know anything about this except that I can go to portlandmaps.com, just like all of you can. You can also go to the, city, the county assessor's office and print this off, just like I have for my house, the Wilshire edition. And all that stuff, it shows exactly what my taxes were for the last 20 years. Yep. It shows a 3% increase. It shows the uh, how much I pay in each of the levies. Uh, so if you can't find your tax statement, here it is. It's very simple. And you can look mine up if you wish to. It's all public record. I can tell you this 
Also, the, the Portland Business Alliance, the largest business association, came very close to opposing these issues, and they only endorsed them with some very specific conditions. It's sort of the tough love that's going on there. And they have the same concerns. The, I've, I'm a life member of the Portland Chamber, and I can tell you this, that the minutes of that meeting and the, the arguing that was going on in that meeting was something fierce, because it's this dilemma that we're all in. We all know that everything is in bad shape. So the dilemma is, do we continue to enable the behavior, giving the addict more money in which to go out and be addictive, or do we say enough is enough and help bring them into recovery? And what recovery is about is right-sizing the district, making good, prudent business senses if we're truly committed to the children. And if you want to go to the Portland Business Alliance or website, you can see the specific position they took about this. Yes, ma'am. Um, I actually have what I think is a simple question. I'm relatively new to the area. I've not gone to court in public schools. Uh, I went to schools in Ohio, sent my kids to schools in Maryland. I've lived here for a year almost. I know that numbers can sound very black and white. They can sound very telling. But it is also easy to misrepresent things in either direction with numbers. So I think lots of interesting questions have been raised this evening. But at least for me personally, I'm not going to take them as case closed. There's been mismanagement, and going cold turkey is the right solution. What I am really disappointed about, though, is that there is no one from the school board here. I know they have many things to do, um, but these are real people who pay real taxes, and they need to hear from the people who have put the bond measure in front of them, not just concerned and involved citizens like the two of you. So I would like to know, maybe both of you can recommend to me, where can I go to hear from the school board? Because frankly, I haven't seen, they may be out talking to the large Portland community about this, but I personally, I read the paper, I follow things on the web, I try to be engaged in my community, but I haven't seen an opportunity for me to go where I could actually hear a presentation and would have opportunities to ask questions or to listen to the questions that the rest of my Portland neighbors have. We'll make a 180 degree turn, look for this gentleman in the back row there, and ask him if there are public appearances by the campaign, why aren't they on the website, and if they are, how do you find it, and where can she go to, to hear from somebody who is from the Portland Public Schools? I'm told there's something in South well, I don't mean you, Lee. I meant the gentleman in the... But if you've got an answer... If it's, if it's on the website, I'll go there. But it's not. I, I can give you a list of uh, that if you'd like to see. May I have a copy of that list? You see, I think it's actually very important. The, the perhaps the bond well, we, we measure do. should be voted for in spite of the issues that have been raised. But it is really hard to make a clear judgment when that isn't out in front of people. And I don't have the history to bring, so in some ways I really need the education. In other cases, I might actually yep. be more neutral. If, um, if you can give us a website link, we could put it on our neighborhood uh, website and okay. Facebook uh, so that people can, can see that information. Provide it to me, I'll make sure it gets to the right place. Perfect. Okay, one more question. And then well, we're actually, gonna... I'll put in a plug for a related event. Yeah, um, um, there are three or four city uh, school board seats up for election this spring. We'll be voting on them at the same election. Again, very tough jobs for which they receive no compensation. If you want to hear those candidates, Directly, I think neighborhood associations may be having meetings, but the Portland League of Women Voters will be sponsoring a candidates forum on uh, Tuesday, April 26th at the school board meeting, and that's a chance to come and hear what the issues are for the school board election. Very good, thank you. Okay, now we're going to uh, take about five minutes each and let each. Uh, One let, let, let. Um, Channel 28 <laughs> evidently rebroadcast board meetings, and there was one on the 28th. Uh, we'll give each of the speakers uh, five minutes to kind of uh, wrap up their case, and then after you'll be able to, they'll be able to stick around a little bit, talk to them in the back of the room. But after they're done, uh, our chair has a couple more business uh, things to take care of. Um, 
and uh, some committee reports that you might be interested in anyway. So uh, go ahead, Scott. Well, it's been an interesting evening. <laughs> um, I just want to say I'm still confused about something that Patrick said about right-sizing the district but don't close neighborhood schools. Uh, show me a school in Portland that's not a neighborhood school. I'm still confused about that, but maybe he can explain it to me later. I will. Thank you. <laughs> or maybe he'll explain it in, in his five minutes. So what you're telling me is that you have doubts about the quality of management of the district, or maybe you're sure that the district is mismanaged. Patrick raised a lot of uh, points that were casting doubt without, to me, ever coming out with some very real specifics about why you should vote no. Um, and it's easy in these times, uh, let's not trust government, just to get caught up in that doubt. And I want to bring us back to focus on the two questions at hand and what the consequences are. And one is, are, do you want to cut a couple of hundred teachers next year? That's the question. And if you think that's tough love and it'll be a good thing and somehow lead to miraculous changes where you are 100% happy with what the school district web is doing, I got news for you. That's not going to happen. Instead, we'll have classrooms that are bigger, teachers who are already stressed, stressed even more. And the quality of education, especially for lower income kids, is going to go down. That's just the way it is. And if you want to make that choice, then vote no. If you want to minimize teachers' cuts that are going to come anyway because of the budget situation, then vote yes. If you want to do something about the quality of education in this district in terms of how decisions are made about how things are managed, there are different avenues for that. There are nonprofit groups that work on that. And that's the way to me to go. That's the responsible way to go. Because the collateral damage from voting no is, and yes, Patrick says ad nauseum, this is about kids. It really is about kids. Same goes for our buildings. You can talk about, gee, decisions that got made 20, 30, 40 years ago. Why is there no sinking fund? Uh, you know, what's the square cost per square footage? I don't know that. I do know that the last two buildings, schools, that were built in Portland were built. Uh, Forest Park is a good school building. It's half completed because the bond just built the, built the first phase of it back in 1995 should have been completed in a 2004 bond that never made it to the ballot. Still needs work to get completed. They have portables out there now because the, that area grew so quickly. The um, Rosa Park School was built on time and under budget. This district is very capable of doing good construction work on time and under budget. And if we don't start now. We have a big project ahead of us. If we don't start now, it's just going to be pushed back and cost even more. You know, if you don't fix the roof in your own house, it gets worse, and the damage gets worse, and it costs more to do it down the road. We need to start now to do this basic maintenance. That's why I'm voting yes. In spite of some questions I have about how the district is run, it's the right thing to do. And it's the responsible thing to do to get those buildings back into shape. 
Thanks. I hope that tonight you've understood that I agree with Scott on all of what he says, with the exception of the last thing he said. It is indeed the right thing to do, but this is not the right time to do it, for all sorts of reasons. 9.9% unemployment. Actual wage capability, the earning power of a dollar in Portland, Oregon going down. The values of homes going down, foreclosures at an all-time rate, all of those kinds of things that we could talk about. But it's the right thing to do. But the way in which they're going about it, it's too big, too much, at the wrong time. We talked, he asked me before about the question, I'm going to rise to this challenge, which is the issue about how do you right-size a district and not close uh, neighborhood schools? Well, I'll give you two examples right now, and I've already given them. One of which happens to be Washington High School, the other one happens to be the space at 42nd and Killingsworth, the former Adams High School. And there are 330 some odd physical locations called the Portland Public School facilities, buildings and grounds. We've already talked about, you hear it in the paper about the, using the Dixon site where the central office is and selling that and taking the money and relocating it. We could go on and on about that. There's plenty of opportunity to pull value out of the system to do some of these things, to right size the system. What it does is two things. It makes available cash, it reduces the, uh, the overhead that we have to maintain all the time, and most importantly what it does, and I want to circle back to this, it's about rebuilding trust. Everybody in this room probably has an anecdote. The most poignant one is this gentleman over here. I remember being that age and having a young family and having all of my hopes and dreams and aspirations tied up in my wife and my children. And we've had a good life in this city. I want that good life to be assured for this gentleman. We talk about equity, that's equity staring us in the face right now. We have betrayed this man and his family three times, not once, three times. So let's start rebuilding trust and a belief. I start off by saying these are not bad people, but there's a bad way in which we're doing business. This should be a slam dunk. My commitment to Scott is on May the 18th, the day after the election results are known to us. I want to redouble efforts to bring out all of us in this room to be involved. Because quite frankly, you've heard the phrase, we have met the enemy and he is us. The reason why we are our own worst enemy is because we are typically not at these meetings. We are typically not doing the hard slogging work that Scott has been doing. Think about it, a dozen years in which he's gone to these meetings, not for compensation. <coughs> Think about the efforts that his teacher and every, his wife, the teacher, and all the other teachers go through. So we've got to redo our efforts. If it in fact takes a village to raise a child, well, we're that village. But the reality is, is that the decisions that are being made by school boards now and in the past, we can't undo. We can only do about tomorrow. And this issue about accountability, the anecdote that Dick talked about, about one high school costing $12 a square foot and one costing $25 a square foot, I suspect you might find that playing itself out. In fact, one of the conditions that the Portland Chamber has established on the Portland Public Schools and endorsing these ballot measures conditionally first time they've ever conditionally endorsed any ballot measure related to that issue. And they still have serious concerns that the largest public construction project in the state of Oregon's history, largest bond, is going to be handled by a school district that doesn't have experience in doing something like that. Uh, I have doubts about that. I shouldn't have doubts about that. And with regards to, uh, once again, this issue about, um, uh, it's about the kids. If it's about the kids, we should not be having any conversation about operations or capital equipment. Why aren't we talking about the fact that graduation rates are 50-some percent and are going down? And if you go to the Jefferson and Roosevelt High School clusters, you find that those are at 40 percent and going down. We should be ashamed of ourselves as a community. And we should hold those people accountable for that, uh, who we entrust in that regard. And that's, as the lady from the League of Women Voters said, we need to do that. So that's what we need. We want, a, we want a public school system that's committed to excellence in the classroom and the physical plant as well. And the way in which we're doing business, and these measures 121 and 122 are not the answer. 
I want to create a crisis. I want May 18th to be the morning where we all wake up in the sharp, the harsh light of day uh, and find out that we've got to redouble our efforts to figure out how we're going to go forward. Because we have one of the last large, good public school systems in the United States of America. We don't want to follow the, the lead of others and go down that path. We want to protect this. <coughs> these measures at this time for these amount of monies without any solution for the future is not the right thing. When you know, K-N-O-W the facts, when you reflect upon the past, you will vote no on 121 and 122. We'd like to thank both Scott Bailey and Patrick Donaldson, and we'd also like to give another hand for Fred Stovall, who worked really hard. Thank you, Travis.